Hello and welcome to another episode of Prime Time, the interview series where I always try and have an insightful conversation with an inspiring youngster. Uh, I'm delighted that today I'm joined by Navya Sharma. Navya is somebody I've known personally for many years. She's from Jaipur. Uh, currently, she's studying in the United States of America at college, but she's had a remarkable journey as a published writer and author, and she's deeply interested in literature, among other things. So without any further delay, let's welcome Navya onto the show and learn uh, more about her inspiring journey directly from her. Welcome, Navya. Thank you, Karthik. It's definitely very nice to see you again after so long. Likewise, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. OK, so let's dive straight into it, Navya. Why don't you, for our viewers, uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Well, um, I have been studying English literature in the US for the past two years. I'm studying creative writing and I'm minoring in philosophy and psychology. Um, the book that Karthik uh, just very graciously mentioned, it's called Scratch. And um, he really helped me bring that um, book to the publishers and to like get it published. He was a great help throughout the journey. and. It was wonderful working with him. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about uh, where exactly in the US you are, which college, what part of the country, and so on. So I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I'm studying at the University of Cincinnati. And it's really nice here. The weather is really bipolar, but um, it's definitely interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, now let's uh, get to your love for literature and writing. And obviously, uh, you know, it developed somewhere as a result of something. So tell us a little bit, go back as far back as possible and tell our younger viewers how this entire passion began. Well, if I were to go really, really back, um, I remember that in first grade, um, it was, I guess I had a free period and I was looking at my English textbook and it had this story of a lion. And I just remember like sitting there and being like, it would be wonderful if I could write stories. And then a couple years later, when I actually got into reading, um, it just kind of hit me out of nowhere that I wanted to be a writer because there was no other place, like there was no other art form or no, not another profession that made me feel as alive and, it was as you know excited as literature did like in books and uh, fiction i basically just kind of find found this nice little home so that's where it all began when i was um i think i made the decision to be a writer when i was 13 years old and ever since then i just didn't look back wonderful and uh, after you had that realization or epiphany um mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the journey, uh, you know, uh, specifically with regard to your book. How did that come about? How did the, the idea germinate? How did it all begin? Okay. Um, well, as soon as I started like reading a lot, I really had this like burning desire inside me to like write something. But of course, like I would sketch out a plot and I would like not like it. I would write 20 pages of it and I would discard it. And that happened like a billion times until um honestly i don't remember how that idea came into being and i don't think i mean it, my brain just kind of did a thing and it was like oh here's this idea how do you like it now it's like it's wonderful so i started plotting it um and ever since the beginning i knew that it was going to be um you know a really fleshed out story because i just wanted to tackle something really big um so I started plotting it and I filled an entire notebook, I think in a week. And then I honestly just got too impatient. I didn't finish planning it and I just jumped right into it. And the process itself was actually really interesting because I would like, well, I would come back from school. I was in 10th grade, ninth grade, ninth or 10th grade when I started writing it. I would come back from school and um, I would have my tuition and everything. And then instead of like doing my homework or anything i would just start writing and i wouldn't stop until like 3 a.m in the morning and there were like nights when i would just not sleep at all because i would just be so excited reading or writing so 
honestly, I don't remember um, forcing myself too much when mm -hmm. I was writing uh, Scratch. Now, however, it's different because now that I'm in college, I have so many more responsibilities. Apparently, I have to take care of myself. I think that's what adulting <laughs> is all about. No one gave me a memo, but okay. <laughs> so now I actually have to like put myself like on a schedule and like, you know, kind of sit down and exercise discipline. But writing Scratch, I want to say that like, it, I just felt like there was like a never ending like pool of motivation and inspiration because it was the first book and I was you know younger in the school. So it was definitely a very, very, very interesting journey. I remember like wanting to throw my laptop across the room a number of times. I uh, remember um, tearing off pages from the, a notebook just because oh, I had writer's block. So it was really, really fun though. Like sweat and tears, all of it, it was great. <laughs> You've kind of answered my next question a little bit, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. What were some of the, because again, uh, just at the cost of repetition, I want more young people, people who are wanting to write seriously to listen to these interviews and especially to yours. So what were some of the challenges that you faced while writing your first book? So um, the biggest challenge I faced was kind of creating a balance between writing and studying. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad actually took my laptop away and wouldn't give it back to me for three whole weeks because I had final exams coming up and I wouldn't stop. Um, I ended up writing on paper, but his strategy didn't work. But that was definitely a big struggle. And I think it's um, given like how our education system is and how like how much, you know, we grow students to like kind of do a lot of hard work. Um, that's definitely a struggle that I think a lot of other young artists face. But again, we just got to balance it. That is something I did not learn in time, but I'm sure other people can. Um, and another challenge that I faced while writing Scratch was, well, this is more like I'm going, I'm going to go into some logistics here. Um, it was basically um, fleshing out the story and kind of like dealing with like parts of the story that I wasn't inherently good at, like writing fight scenes or um, writing romance scenes. I'm terrible at those. So like those logistics, I think they're just kind of based on the strengths and weaknesses of a writer. But at the end of the day, all you can do is kind of go on YouTube, watch a bunch of videos on writing and just hope for the best. And yeah, <laughs> another thing though is that um, as a writer, and I've seen a lot of other, my friends who are writers, I've seen them do it too. We put too much effort and we just focus, we take our first drafts a little too seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start writing it. And if we like write a chapter down and we don't like it, we feel like it's the end of the world because, oh my God, how could we? But one thing that I have learned is that we should never ever take that first draft seriously because that's just, that's the first impression of what your story is going to be on paper. It you can always change it back, and you can always like write something else. And I, I've, I'm sure this has been said before multiple times, but you can't edit a blank page. So because of like that fear and insecurity that you're not writing good enough, myself included, a lot of people end up not writing at all, and that's part of the reason where I feel a lot of writer's block comes from, at least for me. Sure. So um, that's something I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> Did you have any help from your teachers or your folks or friends who were uh, sort of giving you some feedback or criticism, reading you uh, regularly, uh, you know, uh, subsequent drafts? Was, was any of that there? I, I suspect not too much of it since you say you were going to YouTube a lot. <laughs> well, you're right. Um, so my parents, well, my dad, not so much. Um, I would go to my mom and I would talk about my novel a lot, um, but that's about as far as we got. With my friends, um, they would basically help me like get to my laptop. So they would like motivate me a lot because I'd be okay. talking to them and I'd be like, oh, I haven't written to you. They're like, what are you doing? You can take out four hours out of your day, go write. Um, I never really sought out any help from my teachers. Now that I look back on it, I probably should have, um, but I didn't again. Um, and yeah, so I kind of, I, I don't want to say I did it on my 
all on my own because like the support that my friends gave me were it was actually really really helpful and i probably would not have been able to get it through if it weren't for them but yeah yeah but that sounds more like moral support rather than uh, critical uh, or editorial support right yes i mean i did talk about the plot of the book like mm. i would talk about it so i would explain them oh this is what's going to happen this is happening and this is happening and then be like okay that's good or that's not mm. good maybe you could like do this instead but it was all like really conversational i had another young author on my show in an earlier episode uh, he's in fact somebody who published uh, wrote his book in the 7th and 8th grade um and uh, he was uh, explaining to me of course this is very subjective it varies from writer to writer but i wanted to get your perspective on it also so in his opinion uh, you know this whole thing about be disciplined and you know whether you feel like it or not sit down for a couple of hours each day and try and write is all hogwash and you shouldn't do it and you should only sit down and write when you're really feeling it what is your point of view on this okay so truth be told that what exactly what he said is what i believe i tend to believe in as well because um you can't really force art but um and by writing every day what i mean is that even if you feel like you're stuck in your story you can still write something else because writing is a muscle that you need to kind of like work with um mm -hmm. at least like 5 to 6 days a week just just for the sake of practice so if you're writing a story and you can't if you're stuck then it's always nice to just kind of go outside and write about trees and clouds and their shadow or whatever but um I kind of agree with that or what he said that you really cannot force writing you cannot keep it, keep yourself on a schedule in which you're like okay I am going to write this next scene even if I don't have any ideas because half of the times that's just fruitless but writing just for the sake of writing is something that we all as writers love to do and more often than not it just kind of helps because if you're going to write about something random it might just help you you know be inspired and pull out something else that could help your story so that's what i mean by like keeping a discipline and writing sure fair enough now <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about the writing process which uh, fortunately or unfortunately is only part of the entire process uh one big uh, aspect or facet of this whole gig is the publishing aspect of it which also i had asked my previous guest about uh, tell us for again for our younger viewers what was your experience with the entire publishing process what are your thoughts on it yeah mm -hmm. okay so well in the beginning i was quite adamant about getting my book um to a traditional publisher and that was exactly the uh, route i wanted to take but then my dad stepped in and he was just like hey why don't we self publish this and my mom was like we should definitely do that so we had a little fight there they won um they won and so we went uh, so i went the route of self publishing which was a really like fun journey by itself because like most of the logistics that i like needed were all in my hands so um the cover design however i wanted the book to be the marketing it was really like there was a lot of freedom with that so that's definitely an upside to it of course it doesn't have like um the ease that like you know traditional publishers like bring in the sense that they have a whole setup by like already and you just kind of just like slide into it and it kind of works really nicely but you do get a lot of royalties so there's that <laughs> um okay. yeah no you you were adding something okay yeah so i mean now i definitely want to go through a traditional publishing route because i'm not a business woman um but if you are someone who is actually really good with marketing and like numbers or you just know how to put yourself out there and um if you're just good with like selling your art then self publishing is definitely a wonderful route to take in that case okay all right so uh, what what you're saying essentially is that if you're if you're good at marketing yourself that, or or rather let's put it this way a traditional publisher brings with it uh, this set of advantages of marketing you and the book uh, mm -hmm. which self publishing doesn't then it's all on you and if you're good at it you're good at it if you're mm -hmm. not you lose out mm -hmm. yes okay 
All right. Um, okay. Now, uh, uh, you know, tell us. Uh, I I want to focus a little bit on uh, so-called alternative passions and careers a little bit, and uh, you know, you having decided at such a young age that you have sort of found your calling and you want to uh, uh, remain with and in literature for the rest of your life. That's what you're now pursuing academically uh, uh, abroad as well. Was it ever a challenge uh, to convince your folks about this uh, route? One hundred percent, it was a challenge, and that actually really helped because I had to like fight my dad for two years. He wanted me to be a doctor, and mm. that that was just not happening. I'm not that good at science, um, so yeah, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, we had numerous arguments over the course of two years, and ultimately he had to give in because I was really really stubborn, um, but it kind of helped me because now that I had like an external challenge, I didn't right. have a lot of room for self doubt in those early years sure. Um, sure. because I was just so focused on, I was convinced that this is what I wanted to do and I'm glad I was. And um, because I had to fight him, there was I, there was not a lot of self doubt in like, there was not a lot of room for me to fight myself. Over the years, of course that changed, but um, yeah, I had to fight my parents. <laughs> they wanted me, my mom wanted me to be an IS officer. So there was okay. another, she still hopes that I actually go into the service. Right. But uh, the, my inherent question actually here is, again, advice to younger people who are in, in a similar conundrum, mm -hmm. because there are lots of uh, students that I personally teach and come across who are, you know, deeply talented and passionate, say, about photography or filmmaking, but they're just so overwhelmed by their parents and their families that mm -hmm. uh, those pursuits uh, at best remain hobbies and they have to then you know, go into the services or administrative services or any of the more traditional pre-approved career paths. So uh, what would your advice be in terms of you know, sticking to your guns and, and really uh, sticking with your passion and converting that into your profession? Okay, so um, the first thing, if anyone's like stuck in that position, and I've been there, uh, the first thing I suggest them to do is to just go ahead and be honest with your parents, like just go straight up and say that mom and dad, this is what I want to do. They're going to be mad. They might even throw a fit. They might even yell at you. But the most important thing is that um, they need to understand that if you do choose to do something else, you are not going to be very good at it because your heart's not going to be in it. And honestly, I just sat my mom down and I talked to her about an hour for an hour. And I was just telling her that, hey, mom, if you force me to become a doctor, I am going to end up depressed and you don't want that. So. And to be fair, I scared her into thinking that I was going to be really, really sad. And I knew I was going to be, but like it was sort of like I low key emotionally manipulated her into thinking that. Um, and it worked because at the end of the day, if your heart's not in something, you're never going to be truly happy. And at the end of the day, our parents kind of just want what's best for us and they just want us to be happy. So if you if you just keep your ground if you just stand your ground and you just keep going up uh, keep just telling them that hey this is what i'm gonna do and i'm going to do it well then they might actually end up uh, caving in and after all if you're confident about yourself if you really really believe in yourself it's not gonna take long for your parents to see that either like that self-confidence it shows and i mean you know if you believe in yourself i'm pretty sure you can do anything so I mean, each family is different and like sure. we have strict parents and everything and their children, um, whose parents are so strict that they, you know, probably can't like that. The thought of like standing their ground probably makes them really, really scared. But um, yeah, so at the end of the day, that's just what you have to do. Be honest and don't budge. OK, I have another uh, uh, slightly controversial question, not controversial, but uh, debatable, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even I went to film school, you're at uh, school studying literature, and there is this uh, huge school of thought that, especially in the arts, you don't really have to study uh, or do your higher education in that uh, sphere or area. If you're a good writer, you're a good writer. If you're a good, if you have the instinct to be a good filmmaker, you are one. So now that you've 
been studying abroad for a couple of years. Uh, how uh, have you gained and what is the difference you see in yourself as, a, as an artist? What kind of evolution uh, have you noticed as a writer? So um, from what I've learned here is that um, hard work beats talent. So mm -hmm. even though you may have an instinct, um, first of all, congratulations, that's kind of rare. Um, like for each, like it's, it's, it's talent. I mean, of course, every one of us have a talent, but to, to be able to see and realize that that's a big thing in itself. So everyone should be proud of that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a skill and you still need to learn it. Um, I've realized that, um, well, after coming here, I realized that I had numerous flaws in my writing, which I have been working on. And so, yeah, um, you do have to practice and you do have to learn the different skills and everything. But the combination of talent and hard work is actually pretty great. Like that's when people like, you know, change a field or like just do something spectacular. But without learning the skills, I don't think people can get very far. Okay, kind of so have to put in the work. All right, fair enough. And uh, before I let you go, I'm going to completely switch tracks and talk a little bit about the situation that we find ourselves in today, which is the mm -hmm. pandemic. And uh, I don't know what the situation in, uh, in where you are is, but uh, the situation here in India in most parts is pretty bad. We've all been locked up and locked into our houses for a long time now. There's a lot of frustration. People are depressed. So any advice to youngsters your age or even younger on how to cope with these times and how to sort of get, you know, stay engaged and stay sane? Yeah, um, well, first, of all, I don't think India has a lot of option but to stay at home. So that just kind of goes without saying. Um, my biggest advice is going to be that just stay connected, keep don't like isolate yourself, keep talking to your friends, keep video chatting, like um, play Discord, just be really connected to your friends because, you know, at the end of the day, that's like really gonna help. Um, and there are a lot of things that, I guess like another thing would be to kind of just like work on your arts and just to engage in the hobbies that you really like. I mean, I think like that would really, really help like kind of lifting the mood and everything. I mean, um, and there's the third thing, which I have seen a lot of people do, and they recommend it 100%, and so do I. Um, given that we're all stuck at home, it's a great time for self re for self reflection. And uh, if you just get inside your head, um, you know, with the with the with the intention of kind of making yourself better, you can spend like hours and hours thinking. Um, so I feel like that is a wonderful way to uh, make use of this time. Uh, it's definitely a very, very difficult situation. And well, I'm not, I haven't really been in India since the pandemic has started. So I can't, uh, like, I can't say that I've like even suffered even the most minute as like degree of what you guys are going through because fortunately here it's kind of better. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a really, really tough time. And keep I would just say that we just have to keep our hopes high. And we should keep talking about it on social media. So we don't <laughs> feel, you know, less alone. Okay, finally, Navya, what uh, future plans, if any? Okay, so apparently I have to have a real job. <laughs> unfortunate I just can't <laughs> yes <laughs> so um my plan right now is to get a master's and then get a PhD in English literature and um probably go into teaching okay so I can kind of like keep learning and I think that was, that's just going to be really really helpful <laughs> all right so uh when that does happen I'm going to uh hold you to a promise and have you do a masterclass whenever I'm conducting my writing workshops. <laughs> you know, I will definitely take you up on that offer. You have my lovely. promise. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. It's been absolutely lovely having you and chatting. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, stay well, lots of love and take care. It was a pleasure being here, Karthik. Thank you so much. And you Bye -bye. too. Please take a lot of care. <laughs>